Um, welcome to our today's uh, discussion titled A Global Roundtable on the Future of Aviation Policy. Uh, this panel is organized in collaboration with InterVistas, and I would like to uh, thank their leadership team for their help and support through the process of organizing this event. Uh, my name is Bijan Ahmadi. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. Uh, let me briefly uh, talk about our institute before I introduce our moderator. Uh, the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, or IPD, is a Canadian nonprofit and nonpartisan foreign policy think tank dedicated to promoting sustainable peace through diplomacy, dialogue, and constructive engagement. Through its publications, conferences, policy briefings, and recommendations, IPD encourages policymakers and leaders in government, civil society, and business community to adopt a more nuanced and open-minded approach in managing the challenges and geopolitical risks of the 21st century. The discussion today is the fourth panel we are hosting in our COVID-19 discussion series. If you would like to watch the previous panels we hosted in this series, please visit our website. The video recording of this discussion will be available on our website in the next few days as well. Our website is peacediplomacy.org. Now, let me uh, introduce our moderator for today's discussion. Uh, Marcelo Garcia is currently a senior director at InterVistas Consulting. He has broad experience in policy and global advocacy matters in regulated industries. On the aviation front, he has worked with Transport Canada's international aviation policy and with Qatar Airways Aeropolitical and International Regulatory Affairs Department based in Doha, Qatar. During his career, Marcelo has advised governments airlines and industry associations on a wide array of legal, regulatory and advocacy issues such as regional airspace disputes, international public air law, state subsidies, passenger rights, airline partnership agreements and the termination of air service agreements. He has also advised the Canadian government on cross-border joint ventures. Marcelo's integrated approach to global advocacy has led him to coordinate and deploy market access efforts in Australia, India, Japan, Canada, Russia, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, South Africa, Kenya, and Namibia, among others. He holds a Master of Laws from McKeel's Institute of Air and Space Law in Montreal. He has also earned common law JD and civil law degrees from McGill University. Marcelo, thanks for accepting to moderate the discussion today. Please go ahead. The floor is yours. First, please unmute yourself as well. Uh, thank you, Bijan, for your kind words and your introduction. Uh, quite happy as well to uh, collaborate with your institute, and I look forward to many other collaborations. Uh, I'm delighted to be the moderator for today's roundtable on the future of aviation policy post-COVID-19. Today's event will be divided in two sessions, mainly. The first session will be a presentation on the future of mobility by Violeta Burs, former EU Commissioner for Transport and Deputy Prime Minister of Slovenia. For the second session, we will engage in full-on discussion about the policy and regulatory challenges ahead in three regions of the world, the Americas, the European Union, and the Middle East. Without further delay, I would like to introduce InterVista's President and CEO, Solomon Wong. Solomon has helped the aviation industry for more than 20 years. He has triggered regulatory and legislative change on a variety of policy areas. For example, he has led initiatives to improve border processes through the use of technology, ultimately reducing connected times at airports. Solomon also serves on various aviation industries panels, and he works regularly with US and Canadian decision makers on innovative solutions to create a more sustainable policy framework for aviation. Welcome, Solomon. Thank you very much, Marcelo, and also uh, very pleased to join the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy in terms of an important conversation. As we go through a major crisis in aviation travel, as well as the economic ramifications, we're very much reminded that the complete fabric of how we have individuals and goods move from point A to B is a structure around policymaking, the commercial side of the business, facilities and technologies. As the industry recovers, we also need to be mindful that the building blocks, not only for the current pandemic, 
but for future crises will rest in how we come up with solutions. And in Trevistas, we're very much seized with some of the aspects of imagining future sustainability, as well as other aspects of policy that are able to create greater resilience. So the kinds of things that we will look at in terms of imagining different scenarios for recovery, the kinds of things from testing to the ability to support the fabric of economic recovery, those are aspects that we're actively working on for different clients we serve. But in dealing with today's session, I'm honored to have the opportunity to introduce you, Violetta. Um, you need no introduction in terms of some of the amazing work that you did as EU Commissioner of Transport. I think the background that you have in terms of uh, both having uh, you know, an entrepreneurial view as well as the ability to travel through space and time, like your background, I think those are things that are important around mobility solutions, the creation of environmentally friendly, competitive job creation and other aspects that hit at the core of how we establish policies for social fairness across all aspects of sustainability. So I think the strategies that I look forward to your presentation is just how do you look at today's crisis and build into the connectivity, mobility, and also the, the fact that we've got a, a global view to this, that we're not just one country or one region. So the emergence of some of the things that will come as solutions, I think that will be um, exceptional to, to hear from you. So without further delay, I'm, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you for your remarks and, and uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Salman, and uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, thank you, the Institute. Uh, it's a real honor to be here with you. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, of course, a couple of, for five years, I was at the core of the aviation uh, dynamics and uh, really the creation of future directives, but all of a sudden, I'm just helplessly watching uh, how this really mighty industry, uh, you know, vibrant industry was put on hold overnight. Uh, and of course, this I think is for everybody a big wake up call. Um, and uh, the time that we, the COVID gave us, uh, I hope everybody is using to reflect and to see something beyond just what we've known so far. Yeah. And allow me at this point to switch uh, to my presentation, I prepared a few slides just to have a more uh, fluent uh, sort of exchange of thoughts. And uh, yes, uh, aviation, I would argue, is like many other industries, uh, is just challenge, challenge to, to, to reinvent itself, to, to go back to the core of its business uh, and, and see how it can uh, sustainably integrate new protocols and a new uh, perspective on its industry uh, to be able to overcome similar challenges in the future. Because if something scientists agree at this point, that this is not the last challenge that we're gonna have. This is probably not the last uh, crisis uh, in our lifetime. Uh, and that is probably one of the characteristics of the time that we live in these huge changes uh, in the past used to happen over 100 or 200 uh, years. And people, I mean, there was the whole society had by far more time to rethink, to readjust, to find its new ways forward. But today we have to reinvent ourselves in a matter of a couple of years. I saw the other day a graph which is showing that um, in the previous century, it took 70 years for a company to be pushed to reinvention. Uh, and that today is now decreased to three to five years. So uh, maybe COVID just pushed us over the edge uh, to seriously consider uh, how to run the business, how to see this globalization uh, and many other characteristics that come along with it uh, in a slightly different way and not as a static, but as always dynamic uh, field market, if you want. Uh, where unpredictability um, and uh, re 
adjustments uh, are something uh, that is uh, part of the day-to-day -day activities. So in that uh, spirit and with that kind of uh, attitude in mind, I'd like to maybe start uh, the whole presentation with inviting you the, uh, to see how we engage, how we think and how we approach the challenges. Um, it is already acknowledged that our civilization that we live in right now has been dramatically shaped by technologies. And these technologies we brought to such an extent that uh, we now rely almost entirely on a technology to solve every challenge that is thrown uh, on, uh, at our doors. And that's how we went through the first, second, third, fourth industrial revolution. It's not, I, I don't have any intention to go deep and explain what was happening with aviation throughout these uh, different phases. Uh, but already a couple of years ago, when we started to become aware uh, uh, on a, a global uh, consciousness uh, about the climate change and about the devastating consequences of our constant growth and push for industrial uh, development, this uh, Society 5.0 concept emerged from Japan and uh, it kind of took, uh, took over in, in understanding that uh, we cannot put technology in the middle. We have to become a more human-centric society that looks at, uh, from human perspective, on uh, the challenges around us and use technology as a tool, not as a destination, not as a final outcome, but as a tool to achieve something that goes beyond technology, something that actually uh, is the essence of uh, the society as a whole. I got even challenged more and I went beyond. And uh, again, this is just to, to, to somehow picture the environment within which we will have to look for solutions in the future, not only in aviation, but in many other areas. We see that uh, this kind of concept is challenged and got pushed even further. And uh, I'm working personally now uh, most of my time on uh, eco-civilizational paradigm on the actually new civilizational foundation that brings the social and civilizational revolution at the core, uh, looking at people, societies, needs, uh, and try to find the solution from the perspective of people-focused uh, focused, uh, civilization. So in, with that in mind, I will try to reply or try to challenge the aviation industry. That's why I made this introduction, uh, because I do believe that there are some hidden jewels uh, that me potentially we could use. So uh, just quickly, what defines the world today? Which are the questions that we're constantly discussing regardless of the industry again? And here I would invite invitation, uh, in, uh, aviation um, uh, industry and ecosystem as a whole, look beyond aviation because there might be good uh, answers uh, in other sectors, in other areas um, that are experiencing either the same kind of challenges or uh, they are maybe ahead of aviation because they were challenged earlier and they had to already start, they have to find the solutions uh, to these emerging problems sooner. Uh, of course, globalization. We speak about globalization all the time, but really if we look at the essence, the only thing that has been globalized so far were markets, nothing else. Everything else is very much localized. So uh, maybe there is a solution that uh, to today's problem as well, that we look beyond markets and see how we can come together as a society better on a globalized way to have a planetary perspective uh, and look for especially the uh, challenges with climate change, challenges with behavior, challenges with different uh, behavior, not only in a sense of business uh, clients, but in a sense of, of uh, communities as well. Uh, and you will see where I'm going with that uh, later on. Uh, the second element is digitalization. And we, 
already acknowledged that digitalization is a big transformer uh, of our society. You will remember my comments from uh, Society 5.0 and eco-civilization uh, paradigm when uh, I claim that technology is a tool. And uh, from that perspective, we also, uh, I'm inviting everyone to see that really the, the real digitalization is not equally spread around the world. So uh, there are solutions that ask for transitional periods that ask for readjustments. And um, uh, if anything, aviation at this point is very much challenged to, to make sure that uh, sees all the market opportunities, not only those that is used to today. Um, for example, with the recovery, we often hear, and even in my circles, I hear, oh, businesses will take off. Businesses will follow immediately. Business clients will fly. I mean, the only business people will not help aviation to recover. It will have to be a much more massive approach. So uh, to have this personal, personalized note of how people feel, uh, what are the obstacles for them to, to, to fly again, to be active in tourism, to be active in, in, in traveling? Uh, those will be very essential questions. Um, urbanization is another one, and this one will challenge aviation a lot, uh, especially when we look uh, from the urban aviation perspective and how that will fit in the multimodal solutions point to point. Uh, and of course, an even distribution of wealth, which I'm not going to go into it, but aviation is very much um, uh, influenced by that, and global pandemics, which is the reason why we discuss today. So where are the opportunities also for aviation? Circular economy. Today we know that circular economy is no longer a, uh, something that causes additional expenses, but in all fronts is actually op help, uh, optimizing businesses, is helping the bottom line, is bringing efficiency high uh, uh, on a higher level. Direct trade, direct value networks and transparency within direct value networks are certainly a new business opportunity for global, uh, global players. And we see it emerging within circular economy communities already. Uh, and it's, it's a really good tool to show how this uh, push for growth, constant growth, uh, can be enriched by not growing only the profit numbers, but growing the influence and growing the presence in a value network uh, and uh, share, uh, sharing the, the, the created value uh, with the partners within the, uh, the value network uh, to, to achieve better distribution of wealth. And this is where I see opportunity for aviation to act as an ecosystem. Aviation stakeholders are so used to act on their own. Uh, you know, uh, uh, airports on their own, traffic controllers on their own, um, uh, airline uh, providers on their own. This is a challenge for an ecosystem and only when they all sit together, they will find the sustainable solutions. You know, we have so much additional space in optimization of traffic control and traffic actually management systems. It's amazing. I mean, I was shocked to see how uh, old uh, the, the concepts of uh, traffic management in aviation are. So there is an efficiency gain that can be achieved immediately. And of course, uh, to, 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 to put the climate change agenda uh, strongly forward and to really focus on, on concept as a planet first, which is our common home and uh, take responsibility, not only fighting for the bottom line um, uh, achievements, but really push technological developments. Uh, I remember they were almost laughing on my account at the beginning of my mandate when I started to ask questions about the, uh, the hybrid engine in aviation, about clean engines and about uh, alternative fuels and things like that. And in five years time, we already in Europe had a really strong plan for, for uh, decarbonization of aviation and uh, the new hybrid engine is coming in, at the beginning of the 30s. In 2030 till 2035, we will have a, a very strong new solutions in aviation, which will help us to dramatically decrease the impact, not only in, in consumption and pollution of air, but also in uh, pollution of noise, which of course will open a completely new space in the sense of time uh, uh, when the planes can fly uh, and can of course here be a, a good efficiency as well. I already mentioned some of the major 
catalysts of uh, the future of mobility, which will have an influence on, on aviation. Let me go very quickly through. Mobility as a service is transforming the concept of, uh, of mobility, uh, which means that people are thinking about service, point-to-point -point service, um, with the diversified options and, of course, standardized approach in a sense of apps, in a sense of payments, uh, in a sense of a customer relationship. And here, aviation is invited to join forces with other transport modes, which again, aviation was a princess. Aviation was like uh, this uh, almost untouchable um, uh, industry, which I understand why. But now it's time to, to, to really engage with others to, to provide customers experience and uh, not just the flight. Uh, and through that, they will have to hook up together with the, uh, with the uh, urban, uh, urban mobility, with maybe railways, with, uh, with uh, um, uh, better logistic services. Uh, so uh, I see that as a big opportunity. Uh, and the other one is, of course, through that, because we are after now customer experience, we are after point-to-point -point connectivity. You cannot do it without smart solutions, without here the digitalization as a tool is extremely important. Uh, and uh, we can start thinking about mobility avatars. Yeah? So the same thing that is emerging now in health, uh, we will see in mobility that we as individuals, we will have digital avatars for mobility as well. And of course, aviation needs to be a front runner of establishing such an approach and, and, and uh, lead uh, together with others uh, to be able to provide that to the customers. Uh, it's uh, probably uh, needless to say that uh, friendliness will have a decisive role to play uh, and uh, easy to use, uh, clean and quiet. Uh, and this uh, very important people-centric, affordable, available, um, on-demand service. And here I'd like to also bring an attention, which I was very happy to read about, that even employees here, it has to be people-centric. It's not just passengers, it's also partners, and it, uh, business partners, and it's also people. Uh, and I was quite pleased with what I read about uh, Herb uh, from Southwest Airlines when he says, put people and employ, uh, employees first, be genuinely interested in people, bring out the greatness in them and show them tolerance, patience, respect, and empathy. And that is the essence of successful business. And I think aviation uh, is yet to fully embrace this kind of attitude. Um, and uh, only with uh, bringing the right people together, the solutions will emerge. We might be lost today and we might say, oh, we don't know exactly how to solve this problem, but bring the right people together at the table. I'm so confident. That's what I was doing as a commissioner. I didn't have a clue about solutions, but I listened. I listened to people. I brought them together and I engaged them and then uh, led them to agree on the core issues. And then I picked up uh, the key messages and we, we carry them fo uh, forward. So all that, uh, even though it's a characteristic of mobility as a whole, applies to aviation as well. And uh, this trust and respect and reinvention, reinventing itself, uh, will be the leading energies, leading sort of values uh, behind the future success of aviation. Uh, and as you can see, trust, respect, and reinvention is all about people, not technologies. It doesn't cost much. It just needs a human energy to be put into it and to care and to really listen to each other. And through that, uh, new markets will emerge. Um, and through that, uh, instead of following, you know, it will be a driving agenda. Uh, and uh, of course, digitalization will then be uh, seen as a true enabler and tool for uh, uh, multimodality, security, efficiency, uh, autonomous mobility. Uh, you know, the urban aviation space that Europe created, started to create and will probably be uh, up and operational by 2030 as well, will be an important addition. And with the combination of high-speed trains, which will cover the distances, at least in Europe, up to 500, 600 kilometers, 
you can see what I'm saying here, yeah? that aviation will become as a element of multimodal solutions. So uh, with all that uh, in, in, in mind, I do have to say at least one word about uh, something that is very much on the table now. What we're going to do as the first step in this pandemic crisis will be uh, the prerequisite that you will have to be uh, vaccinated in order to be able to get to the plane. Uh, is there, uh, are we going to go so strictly into creating conditions or are we we'll be more open to protocols and use uh, uh, diversified technological solutions in order to establish trust and establish the framework within which the mass in, uh, travel uh, will be uh, emerging again. I'm very much more, I'm more inclined towards uh, creating this more open space to have different types of technology and not to have on off uh, conditions uh, in, in order to, to really bring the aviation um, uh, back uh, in the driving seat for global connectivity. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to uh, give the word back to you, Marcelo. Uh, and of course, if we have time so for some questions or we will explore further the topics in our debate. Uh, wow. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, ideas there. Thank you so much, Violeta, for that uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation as well. I like the the paradigm that is behind uh, your thoughts. Uh, and um, on on that idea of uh, uh, integrating uh, mobility and integrated transportation, what are the things uh, that you think global institutions should be doing right now? I mean, we've seen a lot of disconnection uh, since March regarding travel restrictions, re uh, regarding implementation of protocols. And it seems like integration is the way to go uh, to create further uh, um, wellness for society. However, we have institutions that are perhaps, and this is just a question for you, uh, uh, perhaps uh, need to be reformed or need to be updated. Well, nobody will get unaffected out of this crisis. So yes, everybody has to get itself in a dynamic state. So what first we need to uh, establish innovation is to gain trust uh, on the side of customers to be able to make a step. I remember the uh, terrorist crisis where, uh, of course, aviation was challenged as well very strongly. And with this very clear protocols, transparent protocols, that people knew what is waiting for them uh, throughout the process of traveling uh, from point A to point B, uh, through uh, sort of security measures and technology that helped to establish this trust, uh, the aviation came back, yeah, the traveling uh, re-establish uh, itself. So I think something similar will have to happen in the first phase uh, in this uh, pandemic as well. Uh, protocols, uh, different technological options, uh, predictability in the entire uh, passengers uh, travel, and then uh, more integrated solutions that the passengers could uh, uh, have this point-to-point -point connectivity in a much smoother way. So we have shorter uh, mid-term and long-term uh, and long-term um, uh, jobs to do but again i would like to invite the entire all aviation stakeholders work as an ecosystem don't try to resolve the challenge within vertical uh, um, sort of um, uh, yeah businesses and not like aviation on its own uh, providers on its own, uh, airports on its own, traffic controllers on its own. No, uh, come together, either on a state level, either on a union level, uh, or either within ICAO, uh, where ICAO will have to play an important role here. Yeah. So now we are called as humans to sit down and solve things together, not in, as individual interests, but as an ecosystem. Thank you. Well, I think this is a, this is a great transition into our uh, next uh, session of uh, of the event today, which is uh, uh, basically our global panel. Uh, we um, we are well, we will 
we, as we've discussed so far, governments are busy dealing with new waves uh, of uh, COVID-19, uh, busy as well on containing the social and economic effects of lockdowns. Um, so the intention of the second session is to engage in a discussion on the underlying institutional and structural challenges that are likely to affect the regulatory framework for aviation for many years to come, at both at the national and global levels. Because, uh, of course, we're very uh, much aware that the integration or the promotion of the transportation ecosystem uh, starts with uh, huge inequalities, inequalities in terms of resources, but inequalities in terms of uh, institutional framework. Uh, and we'll discuss some of those issues in the second session. Um, so without further delay, uh, um, I'd like to introduce our stellar group of leaders and policy thinkers that came from uh, around the world. Uh, Anita Mosner joins us from uh, Washington, DC. She's a partner at Holland and Knight and represents airlines, airports, and aviation uh, businesses. She has been at the forefront in the development of airlines alliance and joint ventures in the United States. And she has expensive, extensive experience in aeropolitical affairs, including international aviation negotiations. Welcome, Anita. We also welcome today Juan Carlos Salazar, who is currently Director of Civil Aviation uh, in Colombia. Uh, he's been leading his country's efforts to fight the pandemic, but also the recovery efforts in terms of implementation of new health protocols. Uh, like myself, Juan Carlos is a graduate from McGill's uh, Institute of Air and Space Law, and he was previously advisor for the United Arab Emirates Civil Aviation. Uh, he's also a candidate for Secretary General to ICAO. Bienvenido, Juan Carlos. Gusto tenerte con nosotros. Thank you very uh, much. Our third guest is uh, Pablo Mendes de Leon, who is director at the International Institute of Air and Space at Leiden University in the Netherlands. He's one of the policy thinkers and legal commentators that personally I admire the most. Uh, his views combine legal scholarship and practice, and his insights of European policy have influenced the course of international negotiations in the recent years, uh, as well as the policy positioning of regional industry associations. He's also president of the European Air Law Association, visiting professor at the National University of Singapore and at the University of Bordeaux. Welcome, Pamela. Thank you. Muchas gracias, uh, Marcelo. <laughs> uh, Finally, we are joined also by uh, David Sprecher, current head of aviation, transportation and tourism at Chibolet Law Firm based in Tel Aviv. David has more than 25 years experience in aviation and tourism law and he has advised many industry players across the globe, specifically in Israel, uh, Europe, North Africa, and the Gulf region. He also serves as legal expert in various parliamentary commissions, such as the Economic Commission in Israel's parliament. Welcome, David. Baruch Haba. <laughs> Without further delay, uh, let's much. start with... <laughs> Without further delay, I'd like to uh, start with some regional reviews. Um, Pablo, let's start with you. Uh, um, I think we'd like mm. to hear about your European perspective. Uh, Pre-COVID-19, all the events that happened since March, but also what's, uh, what's ahead for us uh, uh, in the future, and especially in the issues of ownership and control in European competition policy. Um, also, and this is more like a personal thing, I'm curious to know uh, what do you think about the conditionality elements of government support uh, that has been attached to uh, some of the financial packages granted to airlines? Is this trend expected to continue? The floor is yours. Uh, thank you for your very stimulating guidance of this uh, event, uh, uh, Querido uh, Marcello. I'm delighted to see you now in front of me. One day we will catch up physically and that will also be a beautiful moment. But having said that, uh, I want to start as quickly as possible because time is limited. To begin with, I attended two days ago the IATA at a general uh, meeting um, in here in Amsterdam, by the way. And I heard that Europe is actually the most affected region in the world. Um, that is factor number one, which perhaps is relevant for our discussion in terms of COVID-19, of course. At the same time, maybe that's the cause of it, 
it's the densely, a very densely populated area where connectivity is key inside Europe, plus connectivity with other parts of the world. But it matches, it has to be matched, that connectivity with a high level of, uh, high level of awareness, uh, of environmental awareness. And third, and that is where I will zoom in a bit, Marcello and fellow panelists, uh, is the complex governance uh, structure uh, which uh, Europe has, the European Union and countries which are closely related uh, with it, like Switzerland, uh, Norway, Iceland, and so on. Um, we are in a world of transition, we know that, but Europe is constantly in transition. That is at least my perception. We'll hear a bit more from Anita in a second on the US position at the moment. They are going from one president to another. That's also a moment of transition, but Europe is constantly in transition. And the moments and the developments which we are currently experiencing is Brexit, not mentioned, but affecting Europe's air transport, business, connectivity, and uh, environmental awareness and other factors. At the same time, Hungary and Poland make a bit of trouble in terms of political trouble. I will not go into that, but the whole uh, state aid question, to which I will come back in a second, affects, of course, that political relationship between those countries and the European Union uh, bodies. Now, um, at the same time, it is maybe not known to all of you, health is a domestic affair in, uh, in the EU. In, others. In, in other words, the states, the EU states, govern their health problems the way they wish. They are not bound by EU directives in this matter. And they closed their airspace, Marcello, and on their own decision-making based on their own decision-making processes. Neither the ICAO nor the Chicago Convention nor the EU provisions came into those decisions. All of that affects a bit, I believe, the way we should look at how we proceed from here in order to rescue what can be rescued and what has to be rec rescued. Now, uh, I go to uh, the... I wanted to focus a bit more on that governance uh, structure. Um, there are, as I said, three levels of jurisdiction as policy making, domestic, EU state, EU and ICAO, Chicago Convention, ICAO. And all of that has to be somehow, have to, has to be matched. The point is that the Europeans, the European Union is a is accustomed to, well, to finding compromises between all these different interests, environment, connectivity, uh, passenger protection, market access, and so forth, and so forth. And has done that, I must say, in a very sophisticated way, has been shown resilience as to that. And I'm sure that the European Union, the member states, and all the others who will be involved with it will also find uh, a way to cope with the current situation. Now we go a bit into uh, the, the, the air transport sector. I want to zoom in into that sector because that's after all what keeps us busy, dear Marcello. How uh, is the current situation and how do we proceed from there? The current situation is that uh, there is little traffic. Uh, there is of course quite a bit of cargo traffic other speakers may also speak about that in a second. But uh, there are not that many bankruptcies in Europe. We heard about Norwegian uh, Ireland, the, the daughter company of Norwegian Air established in Dublin, has filed for bank bankruptcy. But there, is not, there are not many other bankruptcy cases known as we speak. Now, how does... Uh, that come because we have seen all the dramatic uh, figures on decrease of passenger traffic, especially. You don't have to meet, uh, attend IATA uh, meetings in order to know them. We all know them from our newspapers, from our magazines, um, because of the question of state aid. That is a complex question in 
Europe again, because in principle, state aid is not allowed, at least it is regulated and subject to quite a few regulations. But again, it is a domestic decision. It's a decision of a state to allow and to, uh, uh, state aid or not, supervised again by the, uh, the European bodies. But again, it's basically a domestic decision, which is not an easy one because we currently see two different types of airlines, the traditional ones, the British Airways ones, especially Air France, Lufthansa, SAS, KLM, of course, Austrian Airlines, who receive state aid because they are close to the government, for reasons I don't have to explain to you. On the other hand, we have the newcomers, so to say, the easy jets, which is not in a brilliant situation either, but that is a complex story I will not go into. The, the, the Ryan Airs and the Wizz Airs, who do not ask for state aid apart from Ryanair. But that brings, again, difficult, complex question, because Ryanair is based in a country, Ireland, which is not very much of a state aid country, neither is the UK. It says the market should decide. British Airways received in total 500 million pounds so far. And whereas, for instance, Air France, 7 billion received 7 billion uh, euros, which is basically the same in pounds. Let's not go into that. Now, I'm at the end of my time, uh, Marcello. So how will the picture look like um, in, 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 in the years to come or in the year to come? Uh, the, the polls, the, 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 the reviews show that people want to travel again. Most people want to travel. Uh, again, and uh, I believe that that will uh, pick up. There will be a greater role in the years to come for states in order to control the transition period. There's no doubt about that. Uh, whether there will be more mergers, I doubt it. Uh, competition will be affected. That will be fiercer. As I just said, the two levels of airlines will compete and how they will do that in that complex European structure is a difficult policy, but also a legal question, Marcello, which has to be solved and has somehow to be, uh, well, harmonized the interest of the internal European market and the external market where the carriers are just mentioned, the British Airways, the Air France, the KLMs, the Lufthansa, and so on, play a role. In other words, it's quite a complex picture which I present to you, I realize that I hope I shed a bit of light on it. I'm delighted to further discuss it either in the context of our uh, very prominent and distinguished uh, panel or in, in other fora. Uh, muchas gracias. Thanks a lot for your careful uh, attention. Thank you, Pavla, for, uh, for those uh, insights and for a review of the challenges that the European Union is currently encountering, but also the airline industry and that uh, two groups that are developing slowly, the ones that are being supported by the government and the ones that are not. Uh, now we turn into Anita on the idea of government support. Um, um, the United States has probably one of the most uh, generous uh, aviation packages for the airline industry or aviation sector at large. Uh, it includes wage subsidies. It also includes grants and loans. Um, and I would like to know from Anita, do you have the impression, or, or, or at least uh, from what you've, your conversations with the industry and decision makers in Washington, that this is a strategy to position US airlines at the forefront of that global competition that is developing very, very uh, uh, rapidly with uh, Chinese carriers, for example? Oh, thanks, Marcelo, um, and thank you for inviting me to join our group today. Um, you have a lot of issues here that are here to un unpack. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that when prior to the pandemic, the U.S. carriers had been essentially enjoying record profitability and had had their best years and their strongest balance sheets and all of a sudden um, the um, revenue streams and demand more or less collapsed. 
And so our government, yes, did step in and provided um, $25 billion uh, in the form of loans to passenger carriers and $4 billion to cargo carriers and also wage support that basically expired at the end of um, September. So there was short-term aid that was provided. Um, I think when the, you know, the impetus was to provide support to the industry, it really wasn't with any sort of view necessarily to how the carriers would be you know, internationally. It really was is that you know, these businesses are very much the lifeline to the US economy. And that you know, had there been a full scale collapse, so would go the US economy in terms of connectivity, in terms of supply chains and other things to respond to a pandemic it's absolutely critical to maintain that infrastructure. And I would say that air service um, is very much the backbone of our modern society. So it's one of these things that it was, I think, seen as an absolute imperative. And of course, one of the industries in which uh, the impact was so dramatic. Um, to talk a little bit about, um, there was a point that you and Pablo raised about the need for coordination uh, in response. The one thing that has been somewhat challenging in the United States is the fact that there have been almost very little concerted federal action on the response to the pandemic. So for example, our Department of Transport was asked by um, several entities to impose a mass mandate on uh, in, in, air, in transportation. And um, our Department of Transportation declined to issue a rule in that area. And that makes it much less predictable for persons seeking to use the air transportation system to do that. Um, of course, we're in the middle of a presidential transition. And um, I think we will see some changes from the, um, the Biden administration um, in terms of air policy. And certainly I think uh, a mask mandate will be one of those. Also, I do believe that, you know, hopefully we don't know um, who will be controlling the Senate yet, whether it'll be Democratic or Republican, what our aid, whether we may have a further aid package for the parties. So, I mean, I think to some extent, the U.S. has been very inwardly focused um, in terms of trade. Um, the most notable dispute going on right now we have is with China, in which the U.S. actually imposed restrictions on um, Chinese passenger carriers requiring them to file schedules because of restrictions on, uh, imposed upon U.S. carriers on the operation of flights in the pandemic. Um, at this point, we haven't seen what the new normal is gonna look like in terms of behavior of other governments. But I think the one takeaway I would have from this discussion is that this crisis has, I think, led to a realization among governments across the globe that air transport is um, a value in and of itself, and that there are things that the market can respond to, and there are things at which essentially you may need government intervention in addition to a market response. So I can stop there, and if you want to have questions. Uh, absolutely. On, 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 uh... I'm I'm quite interested in the the question of conditionality as well. I know that the U.S. package, the CARES Act, contained some provisions on and conditions on the carriers, but they were mostly uh, related to governance issues, to salaries for executives. Do you see uh, under a new Biden administration uh, uh, next year and all the conversations that have surrounded the Green Deal uh, and a more environmental approach to the economy? Uh, do you see the U.S. taking similar steps to those that have taken in Europe, for example, to push airlines to renew their fleets and to help for the decarbonization of, of, uh, of the planet? Um, I think that although I think the Biden administration has indicated very strong um, making climate change a very high priority, I think the immediate concern will be essentially um, is basically stabilizing the labor force that supports the airline industry. And I think that um, the, immediate re the immediate reactions will be getting basically money into people's pockets, um, businesses more stable. And then I think at some point they probably will start to think about policy drivers that might encourage 
fleet renewal. Now, the challenge that we have at the moment is that everyone's fleets are largely, every passenger carrier has basically either retired or parked several aircraft. And that leads to a question of whether you do bring them back or do you invest in new kit or others. And I'm, I think that's well beyond the scope of our discussion today in terms of where that is. So, but I think reinvestment in fleet may be a few years down the road, given where we are. And I think the situation is a little too murky for me to try to guess in terms of where that is. In terms of the broader governance issues, I would say that the concern has always been that if, you know, basically carriers receive money, they don't want money used for things like stock buyback. They want to ensure that the, the, the recipients of the funds are actually the frontline workers. And I would anticipate that the, the Biden administration would be um, equally supportive of those goals, if not more so. Thank you. Um, and on, on, on the idea of, uh, uh, of this dynamics between uh, federal or national uh, central governments and uh, regional governments, I'd like to know, uh, now going to Juan Carlos, uh, I know you've been dealing with, uh, uh, with very serious issues there since March. Uh, and um, um, I mean, we know that Latin America was pretty much close to international travel for most countries, uh, actually, since March up to the end of the summer, I believe. And Colombia just reopened in, in, uh, in September, right? Uh, so I'd like to know uh, if, if you can tell us a little bit about the challenges that you've seen as, as director of civil aviation uh, dealing with this dynamic between opening borders and following public health authorities uh, directives. Thank you, Marcelo, and, um, and to the Institute for this invitation. And um, well, I, I have to confess that uh, this crisis has been my daily breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the past uh, nine months. Mm -hmm. And it has been a learning curve, I have to say, because uh, I, I, I can certainly say that any person that I have talked from the industry, from civil aviation or authorities and so on, they said, well, it, it took us by surprise. There is not um, a clear set of rules to do it right or wrong. And so it has been uh, perhaps the most uh, challenging part of this crisis. Um, I believe that this, uh, this um, crisis um, have, uh, have uh, given us the, some lessons or many lessons to all of us. And um, as, as I read an article from Henry Cololet recently, he was, quoting, um, he was quoting Winston Churchill and he was saying, never let a good crisis to go waste. And I think that this is an opportunity for all of us as an aviation system to build a more resilient system. I really enjoyed and took uh, profuse notes from uh, the points that uh, uh, former Commissioner Boch uh, shared with us. Um, I have to say that uh, first of all, uh, during these months, we our first reaction was to understand the uh, scope of this crisis and try to put ourselves together as a system to react to the crisis and as such, our first two steps were to look what other regions in the world that perhaps were ahead, ahead of the core with us were doing. Like um, we, we talked to many Asians, uh, civil aviation authorities, to Middle East, to Europe, to look what sort of measures they were implementing. And we built our health protocols. That was the first step for us to create health protocols and to learn something that uh, Commissioner Boach uh, mentioned, that we are no longer an industry or a sector can, uh, that is self-contained and can work alone. So we learn to engage with others. Certainly I have personally to visit every single airport we have in Colombia and talk to every governor, major, health, uh, um, health uh, director in, in, you know, with responsibility in each airport to try to overcome the big uh, resistance to reopen air services in their airports. The second thing that we did is to put together our recovery plan. How are we going to carefully uh, design a recovery plan that we can rapidly deploy? 
And that was exactly what happened in Colombia. Um, in first September, 2020, finally, the president of Colombia decided that it was the time to recover air connectivity in Colombia. By that time, we had the opportunity to visit every airport, to talk to every authority that I have to talk, and to work very closely with the Ministry of Health. Now they are on our side. Actually, sometimes they are ahead of us. Uh, we want to keep certain things like, uh, for example, uh, COVID tests sometimes. And they said, well, it's no longer need in the, in the, we are in this uh, part of the court. There is no sense that we uh, require, uh, uh, you know, COVID tests at these points and things like that. So we have, we have learned in this process to interact with local governments, to interact with health authorities, and we very rapidly could understand that, uh, we're able to understand that we were not at the driving seat, that we were not going to uh, contribute anything just by complaining how things are going, but we need to work with these other stakeholders. Um, a second thing perhaps is that, um, and, 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 and Commissioner Boch also mentioned, um, this industry needs to be more people-centered. I really like that because we are noticing that right now in my country. You know, we are just recovering connectivity and recovering our industry from this crisis. And now I have like 10 different initiatives in the Congress trying to create more rights, trying to change the way uh, people, uh, uh, you know, can uh, switch or endorse their tickets and, and many things that very much go against the way this industry has been acting for so many decades. And it is every day, it is more and more difficult to make them understand this is the way the industry works. And if you change it, then Colombia will be outside of you know, the rest of the world and it will be disconnected. And, and, and that's a challenge that I see. How can we make uh, this industry to be more um, friendly, nice with the customers that shows respect and empathy for the people that at the end of the day pay for their tickets and pay for the services of everyone and is easy to use. I, 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 I really buy out uh, the very good um, recommendations about where this industry is heading. And I believe that us as regulators, we need to be you know, going in that, uh, in that way. And finally, there is something that I would like to say uh, a lesson that uh, that uh, very much um, we are learning in this process. You know, my organization is not only a civil aviation authority, we also provide air navigation services and we are the owner of the main public airports in Colombia, 72 public airports in Colombia. It's a very complex organization. Well, I will talk later on about, uh, or, or, or in other question, Marcelo, perhaps, about the reorganization of our organization. It's a plan that we were having before COVID and we are very much pushing forward uh, after, you know, in this recovery phase. But what I have to say is that the first uh, impact of this crisis is in airlines. And everyone talks about airlines and how government can help airlines and so on. But air navigation service providers are suffering badly and everyone thinks that this is a, a you know, um, an endless, uh, a bottomless uh, barrel. And air navigation services are also key to maintain connectivity, to have efficient services, and to keep safety. And on the other side, I'm very concerned about civil aviation authorities, regulators. Governments are going to cut, uh, you know, their budgets and, and probably um, civil aviation authorities are going to suffer. And in that back. Round, I believe that right now, and I will connect finally on the question that you were posing, what should an organization like ICAO do? ICAO should necessarily um, take the leadership and speak, be the voice of this sector, of this industry with governments. I believe that um, the president of the Council of ICAO, for example, should right now book uh, travel to every country, every member state, to again ask the governments how important is aviation now in the recovery of their own economies and in the recovery of the world economies. And on the other side, ICAO, of course, needs now more than at any time in history, deliver a public good that is very, very expert or has a long standing uh, tradition in providing. This is harmonization. Harmonization is lost 
as uh, as uh, it was mentioned before by Pablo. Uh, for example, in Europe, is an you know health is a national issue. Well, it same happens in every country in, in the world almost. And then every country is imposing their own requirements and have their own ideas about what they would like to see to before they um, authorize international flights, international travels to come into their territories. And here, aviation needs to interact with important institutions like the World Health Organization, regional institutions like in, in the case of so South America, we have the Pan American Health Organization, which governments at the national level are listening carefully. And ICAO should, in the same sense, not work alone as a self-contained system, but work with other organizations. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, thank you, Juan Carlos. Just to follow up on that idea of, of uh, global leadership and the role of ICAO in the coming years, not only during the recovery, <clears throat> but also uh, after, uh, after recovery, people are uh, talking now about 2023, a few months ago it was 2022. Hopefully we, uh, yeah, everything comes back in 2023. Uh, but definitely, uh, the industry will be uh, changed uh, as, as we move into uh, 2023. And um, one of the takeaways, I've been following very closely travel restrictions since the very beginning of, um, of, of the pandemic. And I've noticed that there's been, even though there hasn't been global coordination, there's been increased regional coordination. Um, uh, and there's been attempts to create travel bubbles in some regions. Some of them have not been publicized. Uh, some of them have been publicized and then withdrawn, like the one uh, last week, Singapore and Hong Kong. So I would also like to uh, hear your views, and, and maybe this is more uh, a, a question that we can discuss as a full panel after uh, David's regional review. But is there a way that, because let's, let's be honest, right? The COVID-19 brought back the nation state to the center of mm -hmm. decision making, right? It's mm -hmm. inevitable that uh, global institutions are there to help, to harmonize, to provide some uh, guidance. However, ultimately, as long as we live in uh, democratic states and we have uh, governments uh, uh, in charge of, of, uh, of societies, uh, public health cannot ever, ever be uh, dealt with at a global level when it's actually a local uh, um, question. Uh, and so this reemergence of the national government, uh, I think is something that I would like to discuss with the panel uh, at large after uh, David. So David, I know you've been waiting there for a while. Uh, we're quite happy, quite excited to have you uh, on the panel. Um, I think you have a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, perspectives as well, uh, not only as, uh, uh, I know you've been very, very involved in, the, in, in, in uh, convincing or advocating in favor of a reopening of the skies in Israel, and recently you've also been involved in uh, uh, negotiations with uh, uh, Israel's new partners in the Gulf, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Uh, so I think it'll be interesting if you can take us through a bit of the challenges that you've encountered and how COVID-19 has reshaped the policy uh, frameworks and the policy environment in uh, Israel. Good evening. Uh, good evening from, from Jerusalem. Uh, tonight, well, I uh, am very, very pleased and very happy to be uh, with, uh, with all of you tonight. Well, actually, um, the situation here, I mean, uh, <laughs> Just before COVID-19, uh, I must point out that uh, Israel uh, recorded a dramatic, fantastic year of uh, incoming tourism in uh, 2018, 2019. Uh, millions of people came here and all of a sudden everything came to a full uh, stop on the uh, 4th of March 2020 uh, when uh, the government uh, decided two things. One, uh, forbid entries to Israel to any person that is not Israeli citizen or resident. And uh, number two, offered us a kind of complimentary 14-day confinement on entry to Israel. Uh, you know, with a little humor. But of course, the situation is extremely, extremely sad. Very, very bad situation. Uh, the skies have 
never been closed because uh, anyone uh, from Israel, we could go and we can go overseas. But with this uh, mandatory 14 day confinement, of course, the traffic is uh, dramatically down. This is on the one side. On the other side, the government decided uh, to uh, uh, give some kind of exceptions to uh, countries that are called green countries. Uh, and uh, people going to the green countries uh, can return to Israel without any PCR testing and without any mandatory confinement. Now, uh, I uh, uh, wrote down uh, the plan to uh, fully reopen the skies and not based on color red or green or green or red, but to have a kind of harmonized system. Uh, and uh, uh, I've been active at the Israeli parliament since August. Uh, I appear at uh, three uh, different commissions, uh, the Economic Commission, the uh, uh, Country Controlling Commission, and a very, very important commission, which is called the Corona Commission at the, at the parliament, at the Knesset, uh, where I'm defending my plan and where I almost every week appear in front of the representatives of the Ministry of Health. Now, lately, uh, and so in the summer, we had a couple of European countries that were declared green. We had Italy, we had Germany, we had the UK. Uh, <clears throat> and while the EU uh, forbade entrance uh, to Israeli citizens to Europe, uh, okay, contrary to the European decisions, we had three European countries, Croatia, Bulgaria, and Greece, that decided to allow entrance to Israeli citizens. Now, in the meantime, all those countries have turned back to red, and uh, the remaining green countries in Israel, bingo, have been decided solely, I believe, solely on political grounds. And actually today, uh, well, we have two countries, not exactly political, but that are green, which are Rwanda and Seychelles Islands. But we have a couple of, I think, highly political green countries, among them UAE, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia. Bahrain and Saudi, and Saudi Arabia has just been declared green yesterday. It's a wonderful example, Saudi Arabia, because Israelis are forbidden to enter Saudi Arabia. And also every citizen that visited Israel with an Israeli stamp on a passport is also denied entrance to Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia is green. And why green? Because Prime Minister Netanyahu visited three or four days ago Saudi Arabia and met with the Crown Prince uh, MBS uh, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And Bahrain, why? Because we have now a peace treaty with Bahrain and UAE, because we also have a peace treaty. No. Regarding the airline market, uh, situation is, is very bizarre. Again, Skies have never been closed, but we've got the 14-day confinement for the vast majority of countries. And for at least two countries, which are UAE and Bahrain, but foremost for, for UAE and also for Seychelles, what do we see now? Since they are green countries, we've seen exactly in two weeks a dramatic boom in the number of flights. Uh, we will uh, normally reach by the 1st of December approximately between 30 and 35 weekly flights between Tel Aviv and Dubai. I mean, Dubai, uh, Abu Dhabi at the moment, no flight to Abu Dhabi because entrance to Abu Dhabi uh, implies 14-day confinement in Abu Dhabi with an electronic bracelet. But Dubai, we expect about 30 to 35 weekly flights, right? And about uh, two weeks ago, there has never been any single flight. I mean, I myself, I had the privilege about two weeks ago to be on the very first flight from Tel Aviv to Dubai. Uh, but well, so this is the situation. And for Seychelles, and I serve in Israel as the legal advisor to Air Seychelles in Israel. Pre-COVID, we had one weekly flight. Post-COVID now, we have already five weekly flights and we expect maybe to reach seven or 10 weekly flights. So this is more a situation, very, very bizarre context, but uh, the context itself is not so good because we absolutely need this reopening of the skies and we still have a lot of problems with the Ministry of Health. Right. This is the situation today. Thank you.
Maybe just a follow-up question. Uh, have there been any uh, state aid or uh, government support uh, from uh, the government to any of the airlines? Because I know Israel is uh, actually pretty much uh, based on international air traffic and international traffic, as you, uh, as you know, has been almost you know, shut down since, since March, uh, has not been really, uh, uh, is not coming back. So uh, what has been Israel's government approach to uh, helping uh, the airline or the aviation sector? So in Israel, we have, uh, actually, we have uh, three airlines. We have the uh, so-called National Airlines, El Al Israel Airlines, uh, which uh, stopped flying between March and resumed flight, flights only about two weeks ago. Uh, not for full volume, but resumed. Uh, in the meantime, El Hal has been sold uh, to uh, 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 to someone else. Uh, so it's a totally privatized company. And we have two other airlines, Arkea and Israel. The only one which never stopped to fly was and is Israel. But the government uh, uh, was keen to uh, to give some aid to the airlines, maybe not totally sufficiently. And also the whole country uh, has a certain policy for unemployment of people during this uh, pandemic. Now, what is in interesting and important right now, because of the peace treaty, especially with the UAE and with Bahrain, and also the fact that we don't have yet a peace treaty with Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia fully opened its airspace to Israel, uh, we now will see a very, very fierce competition from uh, especially UAE airline and might be Gulf Air from Bahrain uh, into Israel. And this will be a huge competition on the Israeli airlines. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you, David, for, for that comprehensive mm -hmm. review of, of uh, the state of the airline sector in, in, in Israel. Now I want to take back to, uh, to the, 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 the round table and uh, go back to this idea that Violeta presented a, um, a few minutes ago about an integrated ecosystem. And as she was uh, explaining the concept, I was, I, uh, all those questions about the role of international institutions the reemergence of the nation state, the increased role uh, of local authorities to protect the population in times of pandemic were coming to mind. And I was trying to make sense, how would a post-pandemic world look like in terms of uh, institutions? Uh, uh, and maybe Juan Carlos, you, you want to start, uh, or Violeta, on... on how can we, what type of reforms uh, global institutions need in terms of interacting with national governments uh, as we go forward? Well, um, if I may, I, I believe that um, the first challenge is how can global institutions contribute and if we can lead uh, this uh, restoration of confidence from the traveling public. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, there are many ways in which I, I believe is that global institutions can contribute, but it's, uh, it's really difficult perhaps to prioritize what will be the strategy, where to start. And yeah. that's very much the discussion nowadays. I, I can see that, for example, what ICAO is doing rather than producing uh, through the normal channels, uh, standards and recommended practices as it, it's used to be for, for so many decades, it uh, very quickly uh, decided on, on, on creating a Council Aviation Recovery Task Force and uh, you know, gave a mandate that is producing some guidelines and those guidelines rather than uh, you know, being part of uh, audits that uh, ICAO is, is, uh, is going to the states and checking if they are complying with, it, it is creating IPACs, like uh, uh, tailor-made uh, packages uh, that will support member states to implement the specific recommendations that the council has given. I believe that that's uh, a very interesting approach that I'm uh, seeing in ICAO because simply we don't have the privilege of time. If we wait for two, three years, you know, to produce standards and then to go and audit member states, 
Whereas by that time, there is no aviation to audit. And, and that's yeah. one interesting thing I see. The second uh, challenge that I see uh, is that the organization, in order to be relevant, and in this case for member states, needs to find ways to be where the action is. And, and here, perhaps the public goods that ICAO can produce are not uh, the same from region to region. There are different needs and expectations in different parts uh, of, of the world. If, if you want to classify ICAO by regional offices in, the, in different regional offices. So for example, um, for ICAO to be relevant in the case of Europe is absolutely necessary that uh, there are solid progress and commitments, if you want, in reducing uh, uh, carbon emissions, in uh, moving forward that agenda. If that agenda doesn't move forward, then uh, simply for uh, European member states, there are, there are perhaps other needs, of course, there are many interests. I'm not saying that's the only interest, but that is key in order for an organization to be relevant in, in Europe. But uh, there are different needs, for example, in Latin America. In Latin America, we would like uh, to see um, other, other sort of um, uh, support, perhaps uh, capacity building and uh, more uh, technical support from the organization in order to restore uh, in a safe, secure manner uh, air connectivity in the region, in a region that doesn't have the highways or the railways. And so that I believe is another change that the organization needs to very rapidly deploy. And I would say that that is to strengthen the, its regional presence and to deliver those public goods that are needed in each region of the member states. Thank you, Juan Carlos. And, and Violeta, a question for you. Uh, I mean, we know that uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk about, uh, uh, you know, people questioning the role of, in, of global institutions that have not been up to the task. Uh, we have the case of the WHO. Uh, ICAO uh, was uh, heavily criticized when I was uh, working for Qatar Airways for not uh, stopping uh, the blockade uh, from 2017. And so there's been a lot of questioning on the relevancy and, and, and the legitimacy of these international institutions that I think are key to uh, move forward like global agenda for a more integrated transportation system and also to ensure that there's no uh, countries left behind, just to use some of the uh, uh, terminology that IKEA uses as well. So what is your view? How can we cross that river of distrust? And, 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 and get into a, a brighter side of, 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 uh, of, of things. Well, how do you create the bridge of, uh, and cross the mistrust is by sitting together and starting trusting each other. I mean, it's so simple as that. Uh, but uh, no, on, on a more serious note, uh, I think that um, we were in a way lucky that with the climate change, um, we started to really learn how to seriously globally engage. And you know that a couple of years ago, uh, three years ago, we actually uh, were able to, um, to get to the historic agreement on decarbonization of aviation, no matter how much is challenged, but uh, we made, made it possible. Uh, and uh, here, everybody had to cooperate. So, uh, on a global issues, multilateral rule-based cooperation is absolute must. There is no doubt about it. And I was really happy that at that time we, we worked together with, well, with uh, US administration, we worked together with Chinese, with Russians, with uh, all Middle East, with all participants, whoever played an important role. I'm not gonna say it was easy. I'm not gonna say that we agreed on everything together, but there was a genuine intention that we find a multilateral solution. Uh, and, you know, we are still learning. We are a young global society. We are so used to being divided and hating each other and competing with each other uh, that we are just learning how to really successfully cooperate and serious challenges like climate change and now this uh, uh, COVID pandemic are just showing us that without that, we not, everybody will be lost. 
So uh, yes, uh, ICAO has to reinvent itself like the whole uh, aviation uh, uh, sector, but it has good experiences. It uh, has good practices. And we need to continue to build on that and show interest for multilateral rule-based agreements. Um, so uh, I, I, I want, would also like to bring uh, your attention to the importance of aviation safety uh, agencies like IASA, uh, FAA, um, uh, are. You know, we had traditionally very fruitful cooperation between IASA and FAA. And uh, I hope this will continue and other uh, agencies are coming on board as well. Uh, so uh, besides uh, this uh, technical dimension, uh, we already have recognized the, the climate dimension that these uh, agencies need to take over. And now it's also health dimension. So, uh, you know, all these agencies are reinventing themselves as well and seeing new opportunities where they can engage. I know that we're expecting now recommendations from IASA any day to come out for, for the COVID crisis, uh, which are needed, they're asked for. and. Uh, and let's just not try to sit down and start criticizing everything, but start engaging and looking for solutions where we can actually move forward together and stronger. That's the way, that's the name of the game. Cooperation. If you ask me three priorities for aviation, cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. You know, that's where the solutions are. Pablo, uh, do, you, do you see the European Union uh, cooperating in this new uh, reform global order uh, where clearly uh, there are issues that are none of the national jurisdiction like public health and this come and conflict with, uh, uh, with national priorities? Uh, how do you see that uh, moving forward from, uh, from a European Union perspective? Uh, do you think that the European Union will, in some instances, just... Uh, uh, take their own way, cooperate with, with international institutions, but really develop a European paradigm? Uh, is that okay? What do you think? Well, in terms of air transport, it is already doing so. The influence of the European Union in, in air transport policies and law, I have to add to that, is quite impressive. Uh, passenger regulations, environmental um, environmental concerns, uh, EU ETS, uh, market access, merger regulation, competition, uh, all of that is picked up by the union as, uh, as an international organization and I must say nearly as a single jurisdiction. Having, been, having uh, said that, uh, Marcello, for health, it is of course a different, uh, a different story because you have to balance the two interests, the air transport interest with the health interests. Uh, so uh, whereas health, as I explained, and as you have very well understood, is very much a national affair. And that's political too, because uh, the prime minister must show, uh, dear citizens, I take care of your health. I know how to balance, uh, to take that as a, a top priority for you guys, please vote for me again at the next elections. Mm. That is yeah. a, a sort of a natural reflex, I believe. But so the European Union will continue to develop its pol pol uh, policies in, in terms of, of air transport, combine it with its environmental uh, awareness, as I said, combine it with its uh, keen interest for passenger protection. But the health uh, situation... <laughs> There it has to, <coughs> it will be restricted to a coordinating or a supply of prov a provision of information uh, between, uh, between, the two, um, between the two levels, as I said. If I may, I wanted to pick up on Juan Carlos's uh, intervention, which I found an inter interesting one in terms of the role of ICAO, if I might proceed on that track, that it will be important for ICAO to also in the future uh, link up with the World Health Organization, but also other organizations which are involved with trade, with environmental policies, maritime policies, perhaps learn from each other. And so I found that from his speech, uh, an inspiring idea. And I will certainly follow up that, that follow up with him and maybe with you as well, Marcello. Thank you, Pablo. Um, I wanted to uh, perhaps touch upon the question of regulatory convergence, right? 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've we've dealt with the Europeans when, when I was in Qatar on this question. There's a lot of uh, tensions there because, yeah. of course, it's it's I interpret it as an uh, um, intervention from an external uh, player into national policies, right? So how can we turn this question of regulatory convergence around when it comes to public health? Because uh, uh, even though you have an international organization that uh, looks after uh, health, uh, the real on the ground uh, policy making is done not only sometimes even at the national level. In the case of Canada, uh, every province has a, a provincial health authority. And so um, when it comes to, uh, you know, people discuss a lot about this question of uh, coordination. We need to coordinate at the, nas at the global level. There's no global coordination. But what, the, what is the likelihood? And I think this is a question perhaps for, for open for the panel and it as well. What is the likelihood that countries will accept to have this regulatory convergence on health issues, because uh, uh, clearly this touches the aviation industry as well. Uh, interesting question. The best question I have ever had in a panel, I would say, uh, uh, Marcello. It's a very interesting one because it has a lot of facets, your question. Um, you and I know each other from the Qatar thing, so to say, the Qatar venture. That was the, 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 the question of fair competition, which you indirectly address now, uh, because the Europeans try to impose their state aid rules or their prohibition on state aid rules to external uh, partners and said, you also have to abide by our ideas on state aid because that is for us what amounts to fair competition. In the same agreement, as you know, Qatar EU, we have a clauses on labor, labor provisions, which is also a national thing in the European Union. In yeah. other words, uh, there is a means to, there is a, a platform for reaching um, convergent, regulatory convergence in such agreements. So far, uh, health has been out of the aviation sector, but now we see that the two are very much influenced by each other. And the way I see it is that the health sector uh, follows the path of the labor sector. In other words, first, of course, the European Union should establish itself. What, how do we look as a European Union on health, which has not yet really happened, but that's step number one. But then they can, then the next step would be how to export it. Well, the only way to export it is either via ICAO, which hopefully will, will be uh, Juan Carlos's task next year or whenever, or via agreements with external partners, hence with Qatar, with Japan, with the US and so on. So those are the two ways to achieve regulatory convergence, ICAO or via uh, separate right. agreements with external partners. Anita, I think you had something. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, yeah, I think you uh, you raised your hand earlier. Uh, I'm sure you have. Uh, you want to share the U.S. perspective on this? Well, I have. I guess two competing thoughts here. I mean, the first of which is that you know, thank God for one thing with the United States, which is that um, transportation is regulated solely by our um, federal government. So we do <laughs> not have the states um, setting policy on air policy. But the one thing that I wanted to talk about, and I think that certainly ICAO in terms of a, a, you know, developing standards and practices is our body internationally. Um, I think the one thing we haven't really talked about is how consumer preference and how the market is going to affect how people travel. And if you look at my backdrop, you know, you have a very pretty business jet that I'm sitting in front of. And what I think what we've learned from this crisis is, is that as the crisis has emerged, people's travel patterns have changed and the effects on the industry have been very disproportionate as well. So in other words, people are traveling a bit more point to point. They are in fact going for business jets. There are parts of the business that have been more resilient than others. In other words, the carriers that, rep that rep you know, take care of people who are doing VFR travel 
are the ones that have been doing relatively better than let's say the network carriers or the carriers that are, you know, deal with business travel. But I frankly think though, at some point you're gonna see some innovation from some smart companies. And that at some point you're gonna see some of that innovation find its way into the regulatory ecosystem and then get incorporated. Because I think to some extent, the market and the carriers and the community are moving as fast or if not faster than the regulator. So that's just my, my, my thought. Thank you, Violet. I, I, I realize we, we, uh, we're almost running out of time, but uh, please, Violet. Just a quick one, because I think Anita brought a, a very important point, uh, and I'd like to bring uh, yet another perspective to it that, uh, you know, cargo and uh, uh, these business jets, they have a completely different logic. Uh, the way how they uh, found themselves uh, in this uh, pandemic uh, era. And I think regulation will have to be sensitive for this market uh, segmentation as well and uh, find uh, different variations of regulation for different marketed segments. Like, uh, and this is something that probably will need to be addressed on the uh, ICAO level as well, because they are part of the global business and global business needs global solutions. Thank you. Uh, Juan Carlos, uh, one last remark perhaps before we uh, close down the, the round table. Well, I, I believe that um, right now um, we, we need to focus on gaining trust and uh, regaining harmonization. That's the, that's the two priorities for the sector, for industry, and uh, for governments as well. And we will continue to work very hard on that um, whilst uh, all of us in the process will learn how this industry can behave and uh, survive or adapt uh, to the future and the new challenges that we face. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Uh, well, uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you for joining uh, our uh, roundtable today. Uh, I think it's been an uh, exciting, a lot of ideas. Uh, thank you, Valeta, for your remarks. I think this sparked a lot of debates. I think the concept of eco-civilization has enormous potential, uh, not only for policymaking, but also to improve the governance at the national level and also international level. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. Pablo, Anita, Juan Carlos, uh, David, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your generous contributions. Uh, it's great to see you. Uh, of course, we miss seeing each other live, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to do it in 2021. Um, uh, our apologies uh, for the audience. I saw there was a couple of questions there uh, that related to uh, government support. Uh, that were, uh, I believe, addressed. It was in the Canadian context. Uh, if, uh, if the audience has any other questions or, or, or any other uh, requests, please uh, direct them to our, our organizers, the Institute. Again, I want to thank uh, the Institute for uh, accepting to uh, getting to its first and a very fruitful collaboration uh, with Intervistas. Um, I think, and this is, uh, in my view, uh, the Institute is this destined to play uh, an important role in shaking conventional thinking in foreign affairs in the Canadian context. And I think uh, the role of the institution also uh, in sparking debate on how we position Canada in a fragmented world will also be quite important. Uh, thank you for the audience uh, who joined us today and for your uh, questions. And thank you for, again, for the round table, uh, for, for, uh, for your um, insights and your interesting ideas. Uh, this will not be the last one of our events. Please stay tuned for our next events. Thank you and see you next time. Uh,